Okay, here we go, folks. Let's get started. All right. So, uh, welcome. My name is uh, Joko McKenna, and I am an English teacher um, and IELTS enthusiast. Uh, IELTS for me is more than just a teaching subject. It is a hobby of mine, something I really enjoy teaching and helping people um, on a volunteer basis uh, and is part of my job. <laughs> uh, um, we'll be talking today a little bit about the IELTS um, in general. I have looked at your responses to the uh, at registration form, and I know there's a variety of things that you're all interested in. Um, and there will be, at the end of my presentation, a time for you to ask any questions that uh, you might have about any part of the test. So if those come up, please you know, have, have some paper handy and, and make notes for yourself, and we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Um, EduLink uh, is our my company, my company. I've been working for them for almost 10 years now. Uh, we, uh, uh, we've been around for almost uh, 12 years and have been the, uh, the, the um, largest privately owned, uh, in other words, Myanmar-based uh, English language training company uh, for, you know, again, the last 10, 12 years. We are your local partner for an international future, we like to say. And as I said, I'll be talking about IELTS in general, but the main topic of today is the, the speaking task. Okay. Uh, in IELTS, there are four parts to the exam, reading, listening, speaking, and writing. Um, we did a, 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 a workshop like this back in March, where we talked a lot about writing. So today we're going to go and talk about speaking. Okay. And uh, we'll be talking about, first of all, why is the speaking test important? Why is it special? Well, I'm going to show you something here. And this is going to show for 2022 some sample results of average scores around the world. Okay. This is a uh, I got this from IELTS organization, IELTS.org, and it shows the uh, select countries of how they did in the world. You notice ranking one, two, seven, eight, eleven, twelve. 11, 12. I didn't include every single one. You can access this at IELTS.org if you are interested. Um, and number one country in the world had the best scores was Spain. Where they don't need to speak English, they speak Spanish. <laughs> Malaysia, Philippines would be is not too surprising as English is a language of government. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a national language, even if most people are not, you know, native speakers. Uh, Zimbabwe in Africa, the similar same way. It's uh, English was the colonial language. Same with Nigeria. Indonesia does pretty well for ASEAN, and there's Myanmar, eh, number seventeen. And this is out of about 60 countries. So, yay. But if we, and then India, Bangladesh, China, Thailand, these are all neighbors of Myanmar, and we're doing better than them. <laughs> I used to teach in Thailand, and I can say overall, Myanmar uh, English language learners um, are far superior. Um, however, what do you notice about this chart when we look at the individual band scores? Okay. All right. So we got uh, listening, 6.9, 6.7 for uh, reading, 6.1, and 6.3, overall 6.6. .6. Of course, I recognize every student is different, and everyone's going to be um, have their own strengths and weaknesses. But having dealt with you know, hundreds, if not a thousand different students over the years, I see these patterns that you see here all the time. And writing is the uh, the lowest score. You can look across. I don't think there is a country where lo the lowest is not writing. Oh, in Japan. 
Okay, their speaking is a little bit lower than their writing, but overall writing is the worst. But close behind that, in most cases worldwide, you know, you'll find that speaking falls below reading and listening. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Hmm. Well, we're going to talk about that. Well, first, let's look at what do reading and listening have in common with each other? Okay, you can divide, you can put reading and listening together in one group and writing and speaking in another because reading and listening involve receiving, okay? English is coming in, either we're coming into your eyes or coming into your ears. Whereas speaking, your English is coming out. <laughs> Produce, you're producing the English or writing it. Speaking, that's how they're similar. Um, and overall, it is the productive skills where uh, generally are lower, but there's good news. It's in these productive skills that you, as a learner, have the most, have the best chance of improving your test scores by studying IELTS. What I mean by that is for reading, yeah, we can, you, you can come and study with us and we can give you all kinds of techniques for how to approach questions and how to analyze what they're asking for. Same thing with listening, you know, looking at questions and anticipating what the answers are going to be. Okay, There are techniques in reading and listening, but your ability to prove, improve your reading and listening uh, is a lot slower than your ability to improve writing and speaking. Your, uh, your ability to read English is not going to change too much from listening to me today, talking to you. <laughs> we could, uh, it only comes, really, from reading. How do you improve your reading? By reading, by reading a lot. And listening, same thing. You know, how do you improve your listening? Through practice. How do you improve your speaking? Well, again, it does depend on your English language ability, but it is in the speaking score and in writing where through an understanding of what the IELTS test is asking for, you can improve your band score by following certain strategies, uh, tips. We, we, in the, I think in our advertising, we said tips and tricks. Well, there's no tricks. <laughs> uh, there's no magic tricks. Let's put it that way. No magic tricks. It's, it's, uh, um, but there are strategies and tips that I can give you, which I will today um, in the speak, talking about the speaking task. Okay. So I hope that uh, you know you understand from looking at this chart, reading and listening, it is, you've got what you've got. However good you are, you can improve it, but it's not going to come through taking a class. It's going to come through hard work and some strategies. But with writing and speaking, it comes down to what I want to talk about today, which is giving the examiners what they want. What do they want to hear or read uh, in your answer so that you can get the score that you deserve, or maybe even better than you deserve. All right. So, yeah, 6.3, 6.9, it's, it's almost a half a point difference. And again, that's throughout. Okay. What is this? Average worldwide. Whoops. Ah, okay. Well, next slide. <laughs> Speaking, what do they want? Well, let's think first about the speaking test and what it is. In the speaking test, you will sit down with an examiner and have a conversation of 15 minutes or so, 12 minutes, actually. The whole thing takes about 15 minutes with the paperwork and the, and the preparation. 
Um, and you're one to one, just you and the examiner in a room somewhere, probably with a desk in front of them. Okay. They'll be making notes and writing. And it doesn't seem like it's a very natural speaking situation. You're not talking at a cafe or, or um, you know, in between classes with friends or uh, it's one to one face to face with a foreigner. Gosh, that seems unusual and difficult, or it might seem that way to you. But really, let's let's think about what are some other situations in life where you might find yourself in the same situation, speaking one-to-one -one with someone sitting down at a desk. And when does that happen? I want to hear from you. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, job interviews. Yeah, that's a, the first one comes to mind. Good. All right. What else? From from the waiter. Oh wait. Oh, okay. Sure. Speaking one to one in a restaurant situation. Sure. Yeah, yeah. If you're a waiter, speaking. Yeah. Answer work. You know, answering questions at work. We can expand that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe when you're getting investigated police interviews yes yeah. yes okay sure investigated um are, do we have any edulink students in the group right now any edulink students well guess what when you when you enter a language school one of the first things they do before they put you in a class is you have to have a, a placement test, an interview with the teacher. Well, you'll sit down and talk and we'll determine what your English level is from talking to you. So these things do happen. It's not completely unique. So some examples. What are some other situations? Answering the question. Job interview, number one. Yeah. What else we got? Uh, a visa. Their country, they might interview you for your visa. Police report. Yeah, you had that one. Uh, language school, then a news interview, uh, focus group. That's a marketing technique where they ask you about your feelings about a product. Dating events. Yeah. Okay. Courtroom testimony. Even a game show. Okay. These things do happen. Now, what do all of these things have in common? When you go to a job interview or you're talking to the police, news interview, they want to hear something. They want to hear something from you. And if you're the interviewee, it's your job to give it to them, right? Give them what they want. They're, of course, different in each situation. But in the IELTS speaking test, okay, there's something or things that they are listening for, that they want you to say. Not, not in your content, not in like your opinions or saying the right or wrong thing, but how you say it. Okay? What they're asking for in the IELTS listening te a speaking test is your ability to communicate in spoken English to do certain things. Okay, and how do they well how how do they judge how well you do that? Each of these interviewing is yes 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 asking for specific things, something that they want to hear, right? Give them what they want. What's that? What they want to hear is four things. Okay? The four, you might have heard this term before, but it's critical that you understand these. Oh my God, look at that table. Oh, look at all those little words. Oh my. These are the IELTS speaking band descriptors, okay? This is what they're uh, marking you on when you're sitting down with them. Uh, and there are four uh, descriptors or four criteria. And I'm going to talk about each one of them individually. Now, I'll, before, I, before I continue, I want to say it's impossible, I think, to, or probably not a good idea, to try to sit there and while you're speaking, 
to try to remember, okay, fluency and coherence, lexical resources, grammatical range and accuracy, and pronunciation. I got to remember all these things to think of 10,000 things while also talking. It makes it very hard. So don't expect to try to consciously remember all four things uh, while you're speaking. But remember them as a group. And we'll, um, after I talk about what each one is, I'll give you some techniques about how to think of this as a whole. Okay? So what are they listening for? Let's break them down one by one. What they're listening Oh, yes. These are the band descriptors. Now, that's the, those are the lower numbers. <laughs> First thing they want to hear is how well do you use spoken English to show control over a variety of grammar? Okay. They won't know the full extent of your grammar knowledge without you showing it. Okay. So when I say show control, it means using things like the proper tenses. That's usually the first thing people, people think of with grammar is tense. But that's not the only thing, of course. There's a lot more to it. Things like complex sentences. Usually we think of this when talking about writing, but being able to include more than one idea together in a sentence using the correct connectors is part of grammar. Okay. Again, I'm just using some examples in here, but you know, uh, passive voice. Passive is not a tense. Passive is uh, again a voice. It's a way of arranging a sentence. You should try to find a way to include that in your speaking test. If you can try to include some conditionals, you will get a better score if you use your conditionals. So again, this is not a grammar class. Some of you, you know, understand what a conditional is, some maybe not. But uh, these would be our if statements, or unless, or if not, or if only. There's lots of them, but mostly using if. And then there's little things that only English teachers are going to notice using expressions like used to talk about things or, or would to talk about things that happened in the past that you don't do anymore. Okay. Modals, more well, again, this is not an English class, but understand that modal verbs like, you know, should or can or um, ought to, or, you know, these, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, these are verbs that go with other verbs to change the mode, that's why they call them modals, will, okay? uh, using those. Uh, reported speech, that's an aspect of grammar. Even, even just simple parts of speech, like being able to use um, adverbs properly, okay? where they go in the sentence. And then the simple things like articles, a, and, and the. Okay, so that's not the whole of grammar, but all of those things that you just saw are aspects of grammar and you may know them and but you got to use them in order for them to know that you know them so that's what they mean by grammatical range you know the, the different point and accuracy okay now i often tell my students that vocabulary is the foundation, is the base upon which all IELTS success begins. Okay? It's, the, it's the building blocks. It's the very, um, the start of success. Okay, so um, you know, broader your range of vocabulary, you don't get credit for just knowing them, but the reason why having a wide vocabulary is useful and important is it allows you to say exactly what you mean okay, precisely and sometimes only certain words will do that okay also part of 
the vocabulary part of the um, one of band descriptors is word forms. Now that's uh, most, not most, but uh, in English, of course, a word will have its noun form and its verb form and its adjective form. <clears throat> and being able to use those different forms, okay, in, in the same, while talking about the same thing, shows that you understand that these words are part of a family. Uh, you'll see, I, I see this all the time on, it must be at least a dozen YouTube videos about, don't say very. I was very upset. I was furious. I was very hungry. I was starving. These are, this is an example of what they call extreme adjectives, where instead of you know, modifying an adjective, you show that you can say the same thing, but to a different degree. The Recently, in May of 2023, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, band descriptors were updated and they placed more, well, actually this is more in the writing, but idiomatic expressions are we, things as simple as phrasal verbs or as complex as, um, um, you know, as, as idioms where the words don't mean the same thing as what they say. Using them is important, but I'll give you this. I'll, I'll, I'll warn you this. Uh, I remember I, I had a student who, well, it was like he was a fish out of water because he tried so hard to get around to saying about how he felt like a fish out of water that he showed exactly what it felt, what it meant by being in in an unfamiliar and uncomfortable place. So don't twist what you what you want to say in order to get to the idioms, but do have some in your tool belt that you're familiar with and are comfortable with uh, that you can use in a variety of settings. Now in IELTS, they're not going to ask you questions about agriculture. They're not gonna ask you questions about um, climatology or about uh, quantum mechanics or um, car repair. There are only certain topics that they're going to talk about. Uh, five major bigger topics are ones that you should be aware of, okay? And I don't have this in a slide, so you might wanna make notes here. Here's the five big ones that they're gonna talk about, okay? First one is education. college, university, particularly in the academic test. Mm -hmm. Second one is family. And what I mean by family, I, I also mean things like parenting and raising children. Mm -hmm. This is something that happens in every country. Every country has education. Every country has children. <laughs> raising them anyway. Okay. Third one is work, employment, mm -hmm. the job place. Fourth one is technology, but not the questions about how technology works, but what are the effects of technology on society? How does tech change the way people live? It's still about people, it's not about computers, but how do computers change, you know, how does high tech change things? And the last one is climate change. Probably the biggest issue we face as a planet and you should be able to talk a little bit about all five of those things. Um, if you don't, start reading some articles <laughs> to, to help yourself get more familiar with those five big topics. And again, those are things that are not culturally specific. They, they affect everybody to a certain extent. Uh, you know, I, I, I worked with a student who was... Um, he came from a tribe of horse herders. They were horsemen. They lived in the in the hills of Afghanistan. And he never lived in a city. And I don't know how he learned English so well, but he was his comment was, I, I'm not too familiar with, with many of these topics. 
That's why they're very careful uh, when they pick questions in the speaking test or in the writing test that are as accessible to as many people as possible. Now, what does that mean for vocabulary? I'm working on a series of word lists. I've got two of them down, two of them so far, where you um, they are topic specific to those five things. A good way to do this is alphabetically. Okay? Can you find 26 words? Well, we don't bother with X. <laughs> I sometimes skip Z as well. But can you find a list of words on a topic that you're not familiar with? I mean, you're not familiar with the words and uh, and learn them, okay? Uh, uh, this I think is important uh, for study that when you study vocabulary, you do it systematically by topic, okay? Find words that are specific to one of those five topics and systematically in a way that, <clears throat> I, I do it alphabetically, where uh, you can you know, each of the words starts with a different letter of the alphabet. Okay, I know several people were asking for study tips. Uh, word lists by topic are important. Got uh, something in the chat here. What was it saying here? Do, do, do. I need to leave because electricity went out. Oh, I'm sorry. I had that problem all day today. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, the next thing they're going to ask you, or they're looking for, is that when you speak, you, you give an answer that's fluent. Fluent means flowing. Okay. Easy to follow. It means that you use connecting words that connect your ideas together. And it answers the question that is being asked. That's the first thing you probably should do. Yeah. Uh, try to avoid too much hesitation. Um, uh, um, that kind of thing. Or repeating. Repeating. Repeating yourself. <laughs> Oftentimes when people don't know or can't think of what they want to say next, they'll just say the same thing they just said uh, again. And that's quite common. So sometimes when people don't know what they want to say next, they'll say the same thing again. Oh, wait, I just did that. So avoid hesitation or repeating yourself. And there are ways to do that, uh, particularly at the beginning of an answer. If you're not sure what to say at the beginning, well, one thing you can do is say, well, I'm not sure what to say about that. It's perfectly acceptable to say you're not quite sure what to say. Or, hmm, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that before. Let me think. Well, even simple things like, well, well, is, doesn't mean anything. It's just a filler to allow your brain to start to think of some things to say. Now, be careful with that. If you say, hmm, that's an interesting question. I've never thought about that before. Make sure it is an interesting question. Not like, what's your name? That's not a that's not one you're gonna answer with, oh, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> you should uh, be ready to go with that. Okay, and I mentioned this, signposting. This, you think about a sign on the side of the road tells you where you are, what's next, okay? Mandalay, that's where we are right now. I'm in Mandalay, you know, 16 kilometers. Yangon, 368 kilometers. Uh, signposting are words that uh, tell the listener where they are in the story. Oftentimes you'll be asked to tell a story. So first, I wanna mention this. And then after that, I'm going to say this. Finally, these are examples of signposting words. Um, discourse markers, that's the same thing. So you say, am I right? These are little phrases that we use when having conversation. Connecting words, these are all things that help uh, an uh, a idea 
come across to the listener in a connected, cohesive way. Okay, and then also as part of this uh, criteria is that you use reasons and examples to explain your answer. Uh, you can't, you, you, saying something is great, but saying something and then backing it up with reasons and example to make your answers longer and more complete falls into this category. Okay. So along with grammar and vocabulary, and here what I'm calling what um, I'm calling uh, immediate together answers, answering the question. The last one that often causes the most difficulty is pronunciation. Pronunciation, I think, is sometimes a challenge to Myanmar learners. And again, this is not, we're not, do we have anyone from outside of Myanmar? Maybe we do. But someone explained something to me once that I don't think uh, you might have thought of it before. So in Myanmar language, your, your native language, you have a lot of English words, loan words. This is true with any, you know, what we've got lots of loan words in English itself. These are words that we take from other languages. And if you think about it, let's see, what are some examples? You, you tell me some English loan words that are used commonly in Myanmar. Cars. Car. Uh, uh, yeah. And platforms. Yeah. And like we call like plate, uh, it's actually like police. We sure. call plate. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And phones. Okay. There's probably some that you don't even realize are English uh, uh, loan words, like Quaker oat. Oh. It comes from Quaker oats. It's a brand. Saika. You know, we drive a you know, bicycle and it's on, it comes from the word sidecar. Saika. Uh, you know, here's one that uh, you're probably using right now. Computer. Right? Computer. I hope I said that right. Now, what what tone do the vowels in these words take? Rising tone? Creaky tone? Falling tone or flat tone? Computa, Saika. They're all, correct me if I'm wrong flat. here, but flat tone. So I think somewhere in the learner's head, they think that all English words are flat tone, but they're not. They're, they don't change the meaning, but we use tones all the time to change how something is heard and the there's you know intonation uh can provide meaning and understanding uh by stressing certain words uh and this is a challenge but if you can do that it really makes a big difference uh to go in order though first of course phonemes are the sounds of sounds the consonants the vowels uh consonant clusters where you get a I know an S T and an R, or a you know a, a, a you know a bunch of consonants together to make one sound or several sounds uh, can be difficult. Um, intonation, word stress for meaning, or emphasis, signaling. Signaling is how we tell people that we're done. At the end of a sentence, your voice should go down, or it, it generally does to, to let people know. You're done talking. Chongqing is not a city in China. Chongqing is a way of talking that we all, in every language, we all use this. Uh, it's where we put groups of words together into chunks in order to say that they're connected together and that they're part of one meaning. Um, I could, if we have time, I'll show you some very good examples of this. Uh, and it is something that they're listening for. Connected speech. Here's one that, uh, is, it's hard. It's harder to produce than I think than to hear. But if I say, you know, something like, do you want to go me later? What? 
Do you want to go out with me later? Juana. Juana is, do you want to? Uh, go out with me later. That's go out with me later. If you, I'm not saying that you should try this yourself, but it is something that they're listening for. Connected speech. Knowing when words flow together. Okay, so. Wait, this isn't the right slide. My order's off. Hang on one second here. I'll be right back. I'm going to check something in my PowerPoint. Okay, so what we'll do is just go back. Okay. Wait. Hmm? Test bar. All right. Zoom, 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 zoom. Okay. So those four slides that I showed you correspond to the hmm? yes, share. Yeah. Correspond with. Go back. Go back. Go back. 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 Your band descriptors. Okay. Talk. We talked about grammatical range and accuracy. Okay. That lexical. That's the one here on the in the middle. Lexical resources. Lexical is just a fancy word for vocabulary. Okay. Fluency and coherence. That was the third thing I talked about, where things where you are um, speaking uh, without something. I won't go through them. We just we went through them all there. And pronunciation. Okay? Those are the four things I showed you on those four slides. Okay, going through them again. Mm -hmm. Doesn't hesitate. Use the signposts. Yeah. Okay. So if you can do those four things, great. Now I have a I mentioned that I have a way for you to remember these that wait a minute, here it is. Okay, that you might find helpful. Gravitas. Now gravitas is an actual word, and it means important that and it usually goes with talking about speaking. His words have lots of gravitas. It comes from the same origin as the word gravity, heavy, important. And so a way that you can remember the four band descriptors is through this word. Gravity, I mean, grammar, okay? Tenses and features, okay? That's the GR. Appropriate vocabulary. So words that fit the particular topic that we're talking about. Okay. Immediate, so no hesitation. Together, meaning they're connected in what they're about, answers, okay. ITA. And S is sound, gravitas. Put those all together and you'll always be aware of what you're being asked to do. And so I hope that you'll at least come away from this discussion here tonight with knowing what are the four band descriptors of the speaking task and what you what they're each one of them is calling for all right what time we got here how's my time doing I can't tell oh I have, I have here okay so um to continue I want to talk about the or you know, we'll, we'll do questions at the end I want to talk about the the different parts of the writing task, excuse me, the speaking task. There are three parts. And one thing about the speaking task that's different than the other three other three tasks is that it seems like the IELTS people actually want you to do well in the speaking task. Very different than the reading and the listening tasks where they're they fill up the questions with traps and tricks and they're trying to get you to say the wrong thing or to write the wrong thing or to answer the wrong question because there's all kinds of um, 
uh, built in parts of the test that are meant to make you do wrong. If IELTS was a person, they wouldn't be very nice. <laughs> it would be a mean person, except for speaking. In part one, really what the goal of part one is, is to get you to relax and warm up. You're going to ask you questions that should be relatively easy to answer. Uh, the first question they're going to ask almost always is going to be, uh, are you a student or do you work? And then their next question will be based on that um, answer. Okay. Um, and so these are questions that are meant to help you relax. They want you to do your best. And it should be easy to answer, uh, but still need to keep some of the things I've been talking about in mind, which change an okay answer to a great answer. So what, um, along with where you're, uh, whether you work or you're a student, they might also ask you questions about, okay, we're going to skip this one. Okay, yes. Yes. I thought I had these skipped. Okay. Ah, here's a, a short list of, eh, maybe not so short, of the types of topics that you might run into in task one. Okay, you'll note, I mentioned the five big ones that are um, I mentioned before. Well, these are smaller little outshoots of that. You know, I mentioned the study, work, hometown, where you live, family, friends, clothes, gifts, things you do every day, food, going out, hobbies, leisure, music, pets, shopping, TV, culture, weather, small talk. However, even in part one, they are listening for you to answer the question uh, and showing that you are listening to the question that's being answered, being asked. Okay. So when they're asking a question like, oh, where are you from? I'm from Mandalay. Oh, okay. Has Mandalay changed much in the last five years? They're not really asking you what you know they don't they don't care <laughs> uh, it's not that they want to find that out they want to find out whether or not you're able to recognize that that particular question has it changed is an invitation for you to show that you know how to use uh more than just the present and the past tense but something like the present perfect tense where we talk about things that happened in the past but still have an effect on now. So when you're listening to the question, think about your answer, but also think what tense was the question in? Because most of the time, that's the the, the tense that you want to answer with uh, like all the time uh, when you respond. Okay. So the topic is X. Has X changed much in the last five years? The answer is present perfect because the question was present perfect. So let's look at some other possible ways that they might ask you questions. Okay. All right. Go through this here. Talk about recent changes, your first experience with X. Again, these are just X could be anything from that first list. Do you prefer X or Y? What do you like? Your favorite X is. Is X different in your country than in others? Okay. Now, um, I sh uh, we talked earlier, or I talked earlier about grammar, and I showed you some other aspects of grammar that go beyond tense. Okay? When they're asking you what your favorite X is, they're inviting you to use a type of grammar called the superlative adjective. Okay, the best, the fastest, the greatest. That's a simple thing that there, it is a part of grammar, it's not vocabulary, that shows you know how to use that. So that question is an invitation to show that. Okay. Um, have you ever, if you could do Z with X, would you? What are they asking for there? I mentioned it earlier in the grammar part.
What is that if you could? What kind of sentence is that? Conditional. Conditionals, right. Okay. So if it's a conditional in the question, your condition your answer better be in the conditional. Okay. Did you X as a child? People sometimes, usually, often, what are those? Okay, so now we're going to do a little bit. Um, we're going to open it up. See, we got about 10 people here. Um, uh, you can you can click on the little pencil in their control panel. It says annotate. Yeah, they have allowed that, right? Yeah. All right. And have you ever okay, annotate? Click on that, and then you can type in. Spell the little T here. Have you ever? What part of language are we? Wait, only original hosts can change what? Change this setting. Hmm? Oh, I can do it over here. Oh, I see. I see. I can do it over here. Superlatives, comparatives, when you think future forms, yes, present perfect. If you could, would you? Conditionals, there are real and unreal conditionals. Past tense, I mentioned earlier, used to and would. Very, we don't think about this very much, but that's an aspect of grammar. Adverbs of frequency, modals, modals of advice, superlatives. Frequency, present continuous. Okay, so again, part one is meant to make you relax, but don't miss the opportunity to show some grammar and vocabulary if you have a chance. Okay? Now, in part two of the speaking test, you'll be given a card, and on the card is a topic and some talking points that you should, don't have to, but you should talk about. You're then given one minute to think about your answer and make some notes if you wish. And then you need to speak for one to two minutes and they call this the long form, all right? Let's talk just real quick about what to use that time for. Okay, I just said that. <laughs> <clears throat> so think of some appropriate uncommon words that you can use and, and make note of them, okay? Now you don't have time to write out sentences but you can use symbols to help yourself organize. Now, here's an example of some example notes. Look how the student wrote their notes, okay? Um, the question was, oh, it's not on there. Uh, the question was, uh, name a, or talk about a teacher who had an, a, had an ex, um, a experience, uh, why is it not there? Oh yeah, here it is. Describe a teacher who made a strong impression on you. You should say who the teacher was, where and what they taught, what they did that made an impression. Okay. And what does it say at the bottom? I can't quite read that. Oops. Okay. And here, this person used what we call a spider gram or a, mo oh, a um, mind map where they put the topic in the middle and put some legs on it like a spider. Okay, psych at ECT, this is you can sort of figure which of the points um, that these were meant to uh, address. And this unfortunately does not work. I couldn't make it work and I lost the I'm audio recording. About one teacher. Oh, hey, there it is. An impression on me. Oh. He was an instructor can you hear of that? psychology at Edmonds Community College 
where I was taking some classes. Uh, I had already graduated by that point, and these were mostly just out of self-interest. Now, I can't remember his name, but I do remember what he looks like, how he spoke, and I really don't remember much of what he said, but how he said it, that was the important thing. He would walk all over the classroom. He didn't stand in one spot and write on the board. He would look us in the eye and make eye contact. He uh, would um, always deliver his lectures with a smile on his face, and he was entertaining, interesting, and authoritative. He knew his stuff. Now, why that will always uh, impress me is that now that I am a teacher, I try to emulate some of his style. Yes, some of the things I do, I took from him. Now, I later learned that these are actual teaching techniques, but I hope I'll always have the same kind of energy and entertaining demeanor that um, my, my instructor had back then. Okay, so now, all right, discuss with a partner. Did the speaker include everything from the notes? Well, the speaker didn't know the name of the teacher, so you can say no there. But answer all parts of the question, yes. Did he hesitate sometimes? Yes, that's natural. Don't beat yourself up if you hesitate on occasion. <laughs> so the speaker could not remember the name of the teacher. Do you think it would have been better if he had lied and said, hey, I'm Mr. Johnson. Is it okay to invent an answer to make things up in your speaking test? Do you think that's okay? Yeah, I think it would be like a lot smoother if he did, you know? Yes, okay, yes. It's a complicated answer, but yeah, the answer is yes, it's okay. But don't make it up so much to the point that you can't remember the details, okay? You can lie about little things, but don't lie about big things. Okay, and there was a lot of pronunciation features there. But one thing I do want to point out on that answer is that like many of the part two questions, you are asked to tell a story. In that answer, he talked about who the person was, okay? But then talked about how that affected him in the present and also that he hopes in the future, he will continue to use some of these techniques. So past, present, future, they call it PPF. It's a basic strategy for answering long questions that you can use to structure what you're going to say. Past, present, future. And if you move, and it's not hard to remember, but this answer included all three of those. And that's a technique that we recommend. Yes. Okay. And then we just have a few minutes left to talk about part three. Now, part three, they will talk about more complicated things that arise out of part two. Okay. It's similar to part one, but uh, the questions are written to elicit language things. Expect more advanced structures like impersonal passive unreal past conditionals, the future perfect, the future perfect continuous, the past in the future, just to name a few, okay? Now, you might be asked to talk about unfamiliar topics that you've never thought about before. Think of, at least you're better off than that horseman from Afghanistan. Don't panic. If you can't think of an answer, use hedging. Well, it might be because set phrases like that's an interesting question and paraphrasing repeat the question back to the examiner in a different way not the same words in the same order but this will allow you some time to think and maybe help you understand the question a little bit better okay and again when you're sitting down for this part try to think of it more as of a discussion okay? now you're not at the desk face-to-face, -face, you're having a conversation more than an interview. 
The examiner actually doesn't have to ask, has a lot of questions that they can choose from uh, when they're talking. So they uh, allow the conversation to go certain ways. And one thing I recommend or to, 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 uh, to keep in mind is that if you get a really difficult question that you're not sure how to answer, that's good news. It shows that you've done well so that the examiner thinks that you can handle that type of question. If you're you know, fumbling along in, in a band four, they're not going to ask the di most difficult questions. So if you get a difficult question, that's a good sign. Okay, and then I have some practice questions and such that we could go over, and if this was a longer seminar, we would. But um, just these are just examples, okay? Mm -hmm. And I will then go ahead. These are examples of questions you might get in part one. Please, you're just going to go through these quickly. Okay, here's a part two question. Describe your favorite piece of clothing. Okay, so that concludes my presentation on the speaking test. Q&A, question and answer. Anything you want to know about IELTS? If I don't know the answer, I will lie. No, no. If I don't know the answer, I will tell you I don't know the answer, but I probably do. <laughs> you want to raise your hand? You can use the... Ah, yeah. Charles, oh, please, go ahead. Yeah, the one thing that I want to ask is like I usually practice grammar, I like grammar from like from the book, but 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 I didn't usually use it, and sometimes I forgot it. How do I like practice to be more memorable? Like kind of like that. Some tip? Can I get it? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, that's the thing is there's there's a whole idea in English language teaching nowadays that we shouldn't even teach grammar. The grammar should come about naturally through uh, listening and absorbing and reproducing it uh, in a natural way. Okay. And yes, I think that's the best way to improve your grammar is to be exposed to and hear how it's used in a variety of situations. Uh, like for example, let's talk about driving a car. Okay. How do you get better at driving a car? By driving, by, by, by practicing, by doing it. Yeah. Uh, but we don't think about what the right thing to do is when we're doing it. But you're not going to drive without learning the rules and okay, what you have to do or should do. So I think that uh, the the way way to improve your grammar would be to listen for opportunities to use grammar that you use less often. Okay? It's not hard to use the present simple and the past simple and even the present continuous tenses um, correctly, but knowing when to use the present perfect or the past perfect, uh, that's less common. So I, again, um, mentioned that have you ever that kind of thing. That's uh, yeah. hearing and recognizing those opportunities is a way to produce the grammar that you want. Yeah, I got it. Thank you for answering. Uh, okay, anyone else? Please don't be shy. Oh, wait, power went out. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> Perfect timing. Oh, wait. Oh, there it's back on. Okay. Uh, everything went off for a second there. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, song, song, please, Meg. Uh, so like whenever I'm in an exam room, you know, I just get like so nervous and then I, I forget everything, mm -hmm. you know. So like, do you have any tips to like soothe yourself down when you're mm -hmm. with an examiner? Sure, okay. Um, pretend like you are not yourself. <laughs> what I mean by that is, uh, understand that you only have to to do this to 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 talk this way to to express yourself for ten minutes, and then you're done. Okay, so uh, it'll be over quick, and I think that seeing the end makes the process easier. Okay, 
I'll, I'll share with you a quick story of, of a student I had who, um, you know, she her, her pronunciation, all of it went out the window whenever she was doing a, a sample exam with me, okay? She would talk like this, very straight and blah, 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 blah. She would lose all of her pronunciation. And I said, don't do that, do this. She said, but teacher, I don't talk like that. Well, you don't have to talk like that all the time, just during the test and just during that point. So consider it a performance. I know how to overcome performance anxiety is think of it as you're just acting. And you're, you're just given a show for that time. It's a very important show, but it's just uh, it's just a show. Okay, I hope that helps. Okay, so any other questions? Feel free. Uh, teacher, please. Uh, Go ahead. Um. Awesome. Uh, yeah. I. Uh, I had a question uh, during my placement text, and the question was like, uh, how do you think of the changes of Myanmar uh, after 10 years? Yeah, he, I, I was asked the question uh, during my placement test. So I, I think I, uh, I didn't have any idea of it, and I was like, um, no words to to answer the question so i uh, do you have any tips and trick to 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 this kind of difficult question sure sure okay well if you don't have an answer to a question think what would somebody say what would somebody else say if they had an yes. answer okay so i don't know what the what the country will be like in 10 years but imagine that someone did, okay? Someone else. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What might, you know, my neighbor say about that question? Because remember, you don't have to be right. You don't have to be, you know, they're not going to, there's no right or wrong answers. Okay? Uh -huh. You could say that, well, you know, I don't know for sure what things will be like in 10 years, okay? But if I were to guess, um, I think that, yeah, um, and I don't want to say anything political here, or that's an interesting, but yeah, that yeah, we yeah. will have developed quite a bit. Uh, it's hard to say how much, but certainly more people will. Anyway, I don't want to answer the question, but um, if you can't think of an answer, would say, I don't have an opinion, but this person probably does. What would they say? It's a, it's a little trick, but. Um, it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, what yes, if you, teacher, I get you, ask, it. you have a an aunt or an uncle who you know fairly well, or your parents. I'm sorry. You have, like, for example, your parents. If you asked your dad that yeah. question, that same question you asked your father that uh -huh. question, what would he say? It might be easier for you to answer thinking about what someone else would say than what you would say. Oh, uh, okay, teacher. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. All right. And anyone else? One. Mm -hmm. You have. This is your chance. Okay. Um. On that note, uh, I'll finish with. Oops, not WhatsApp. Okay, and then... All right, so um, I think what we'll do is um, after this, uh, after this is over, or it's over now, um, do thank you for sharing your email with us. Uh, pay attention to that. Uh, we'll send you some follow-up uh, slides, maybe a, a, a short version of the presentation I just gave, um, and uh, some tips and tricks and links and offers to join Edulink. So thank you guys very much for coming. I hope you found this useful. And uh, we'll be doing another one of these 
uh, before the end of the year. I think. <laughs> Talk to them. But soon, there will be part three. This was We did writing, and we did speaking, and then part three is to be determined. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end this now. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir, Goodbye. for sharing this.